athletes to authors, entertainers to innovators. We connect with those who help shape our culture. Join us in revealing stories of their lives and backgrounds, their triumphs and tragedies that molded them into who they are today. Authentically off script and personally illuminating, this is Audibles with Jason Scarborough. This week on Audibles, Mo Williams. So your story starts on December 19th, 1982. We were just talking about how long ago that sounds at this point, yeah. right? But, yeah. but growing up, how, how would you describe growing up? I mean, I come from a two-parent household. Um, you know, growing up, you know, my, my dad, you know, working two jobs. Uh, my mom, school teacher. I come from a loving family, four siblings. Um, you know, we... Uh, you know, we grew up on the north side of, of, of Jackson. You know, went to Green Elementary, went to Chestain Middle School, went to Murrah High School. Um, you know, just growing up, you know, in the neighborhood, you know, around, you know, everything you can imagine. And my parents kept me focused, kept me in sports, um, kept me, um, I would say, busy, you know, just so I wouldn't be in the streets with, um, you know, with, with around things or around people that wasn't doing things that I strive to, to do. And sports really kept me in a, in a disciplinary state mm -hmm. where you're playing baseball, you're playing football, you're playing basketball, and, and coaches always kept you grounded, you know, with, with discipline. And it, I just took all those uh, disciplinary, you know, kind of moments, you know, in practice, in games, and turning in life goals. You talked about your parents kind of keeping you involved in, in sports. Now, is your family an athletic family? Or are you really the first yeah, my dad. My dad played sports. Mm -hmm. um, my dad played football, um, but, but went to the Army um, to support his family. And my mom, um, she, she never played sports. She, she's, the, she's the brainiac of the family. Um, <laughs> you know, graduated from Jackson State. Um, you know, been a, been a teacher for all her life. Um, before she retired. So, you know, my background is that. My brother played sports. My sister played sports up to a point I did. And also my little brother um, played sports growing up. So we're a sports family. My, my, my parents did a great job of keeping us in sports. Um, and what that did was in sports, our friends became our teammates, um, not, not guys that, you know, in the streets, not going to school or doing, any, doing things that are illegal that, you know, we'll be attached to. Do you remember how young you were when sports really started becoming important to you? Something Absolutely. you wanted to say? Um, I started playing baseball when I was four years old. And um, people that really, really know me, they always say, you know, they know me as, you know, Mo Williams, you know, basketball, NBA. But the real people that know me say, man, he was a better baseball player. Really? Uh, which I was. You know, I started playing baseball when I was four. I didn't start playing organized basketball until I was nine years old. Um, but baseball was all my always my love. I played baseball all the way through high school. When I went to college, that's when I um, played one sport. Um, baseball is my love, uh, and that's that's not um, degrading basketball because I love basketball tremendously. But um, I have a I have a love for baseball that's just as high as basketball. So speaking of high school, how would you describe Mo Williams in high school? Oh, Mo Williams in high school at Murrah High School, man, fourteen hundred. Um, I mean, that experience was great. I mean, I, I, I played for a terrific coach and Bob Frith and Coach Brown. Um, I mean, going into that legacy, everything Merle meant, I was so excited to go to, go to Merle and play, um, you know, for Merle, just for the tradition, all the guys that came before me, um, coming in as a freshman, knowing that historically freshmen don't play varsity. And I had the opportunity as a freshman to play varsity with uh, with guys that, that are my best friends today, and I, I, I enjoy it every minute. So you attend Murrah High School. You talked about Murrah. JPS, they produced a ton of basketball talent on the hardwood. So if you had to describe your high school basketball career, how, how would you describe it? Uh, I mean, when, when you're talking about in, in 98 to 2001 when I was in high school, you're talking about JPS Sports is at the height. I mean, it doesn't matter who you play, if it's Callaway, if it's uh, Provine, if it's Lanier, if it's Jim Hill, if it's Wingfield. 
you know, it doesn't matter. It's a battle. It's a battle. And you got guys like Mario Joyner, you know, you got guys like Trey Sanders, Mario Miles. I can go down the line of JPS guys, Darius Rice, James Thomas. Um, all those guys at every school had two to three guys that can really play. And back then, when you look at that Danny Dozen list, out of those 12, maybe seven or eight of those guys are in JPS. You know, you may sprinkle a couple guys from the coast and a couple guys in, you know, Olive Branch, whatever the case may be, but predominantly those guys come from JPS. So you knew, um, and, and this is the thing, we all knew each other because outside of um, playing high school basketball. We all played against each other, pick up games at the local YMCA on fortification. That's where we, we played in one place. So if it was a pickup game going on, we was all in one place. So we battled year round. And it was, and when, and when you play uh, during the season and you play against another JPS team, it's bragging rights. You know, you, you're gonna see this guy next Sunday at the Y. And so you gotta have something to talk about. So your high school career, your name Mr. Basketball during your senior season at Murrah in 2001, McDonald's All-America, Parade Magazine, third team All-America honors. It's a really decorated career at Murrah, but is there something that you're most proud of about your high school career that maybe doesn't get the, the pub or the ink that, that you want it to or hope that it does? No, I, I think I got all the pub. You know, I think that, um, you know, rightfully so, I, I put in a lot of work. Um, you know, I got the the the, uh, the McDonald's All American, the Mr. Basketball, everything that I deserve. Um, so so no gripe there. Um, the the thing that that sits with me the most to this day is um, losing two state championships my junior and senior year. You know, my junior year um, in the Final Four. You know, um, you know my my junior year in the state championship. I'm sorry, um, with the ball in my hands. You know, tie game to win it. They sent a double team, I give it up, we miss the shot, go to overtime, and lose the game. And I sit with that loss, you know, to this day, and I will make the same play. I will get a ball up because it was the right play to make. Um, I have some people saying, man, I don't care, you got to shoot that shot, but <laughs> I'm all about making the right play, and it was the right play to make. In my senior year, um, you know, we was picked to win it, and you know, win the Final Four and, and lose by two points, four points, I want to say. And that was my senior year. And to leave high school um, with, the, with the career I had, with the teams that I was able to um, play, play with, my teammates, the good teams that I was on, to not leave with a state championship, it really bothers me. I've won a championship on every level I played on except for high school. And that's something I can't get back. Don't go anywhere. Audible's returns in a moment here on the Spirit Media Network. When you find a great community, you will find great health care. That is exactly what King's Daughters Medical Center provides. Keeping businesses moving with occupational wellness, heart-healthy screenings, diabetes education and management, community education, and remote patient monitoring that promotes better care in between regular office visits. KDMC, caring for our community like no one else can. Wendy's $3 breakfast deal is a bacon or sausage croissant plus seasoned potatoes for just three bucks. It's the kind of breakfast that really sticks with you, especially if you're Tyler. Ah. Our breakfast. Oh. If you want a better breakfast you'll never forget, Wendy's is that breakfast. Choose wisely. Choose Wendy's $3 breakfast deal.
Coming out of Murrah, what schools were you interested in playing for and what schools were, were recruiting you? Ole Miss, um, because my childhood friends, Justin Reed, Aaron Harper, you know, Dave Sanders, you know, Tommy Kelly was there, um, and Raheem was there. And I knew all those guys. And Ole Miss was the school that I definitely was considering. Um, Mississippi State recruited me hard. But Ole Miss was, was uh, ahead of them just because of the relationship of the teammates, players that was there. Um, Georgetown was big on my list. Uh, Miami was big on my list at the time. Leonard Hamilton was at Miami. He's at Florida State now. Um, UCLA was on my list. Um, North Carolina was on my list. I was getting, getting recruited by everybody in the country, but I would say those were the main schools that I was interested in. But obviously I knew where I wanted to go. Um, that was Alabama. I committed to them my junior year, going into my junior year. So I, I knew where I wanted to go to school. So I played my junior and senior year, um, already committed to University of Alabama. And, um, you know, that was the best, one of the best decisions of my life. I enjoyed every minute there. What was it about Alabama that, that sealed it for you to, to go there? Well, for me, at the time, um, Ole Miss had, had that team that went to the Sweet 16. Um, um, UCLA was just, um, you know, all those teams that I, all those schools I just mentioned, all of them went to the tournament the previous year, mm -hmm. every last one of them, except for Alabama. Um, before I got to Alabama, they haven't been to the tournament in, I want to say, 10 years. Um, but going on the visit, being around them, being around the coaches, um, it felt like it was a fit. I felt like they had a really good team. They just needed a point guard. And um, I made that decision, and it, it raised, you know, a lot of eyebrows. And it was like, why, why are you going there? You can go anywhere in the country. And um, for me, I had a vision, and I had to trust my gut. And it turned out to be great. You know, we was <laughs> we were number one in the SEC my freshman year. Yeah, you guys were undefeated at home that year, 17 and 0, 27 and 8 overall record. You mentioned the regular season championship, so you got to be thinking, hey, college basketball, no problem, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it was a great experience, man. I, and, 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 and that goes to show when you're together, you can accomplish a lot. You know, mm -hmm. instead of by yourself. And we did that together as a team. It wasn't just me. I was just a freshman, so I was young. I'm still learning at the same time, but I had a great team around me. And we, we and to this day, and this is what I would say, to this day, that team that I was on in Alabama, we're all, we're, we're all 40 plus years old now. We're all close. We all mm -hmm. talk. You know, um, I played with Antoine Petway, just mm -hmm. to name one. He's assistant coach at Alabama now. Before I, I'm doing this interview now, I was talking to him before walking in here. We've been close, you know, ever since college. And that goes for our whole team. You know, one of my teammates is a, a financial guy at Morgan Stanley. He's my financial advisor, my teammate. <laughs> you know, so that just show, goes to show how close we were as a team and why we won so many games. The 2002 season you mentioned being the number two seed, that, that season doesn't end the way that you guys wanted it, it to. Doesn't. but. Starting as a freshman, mm -hmm. playing in the SEC, what lessons would you say you learned in, in that season? Well, I learned what high-level basketball looks and feels like, right? You know, I'm talking about every single night, you got to compete. And at that time, and, and the SEC is, is getting back to that, but at that time, we was the best basketball league in the country. Because when, when you start talking about how many teams going to the tournament from each conference. Mm -hmm. We was getting the most. My, my two years at, at Alabama, my freshman year, we got seven teams in the tournament. My sophomore year, we got six teams in the tournament, you know, in, a, in one conference. And at that time, it was only 12 teams, you know. So half the league was going to the NCAA tournament. And we're getting back to that um, in the SEC. Um, but for a while, we was kind of down. But back then, man, it was you talking about high level basketball each and every night, doesn't matter. You, you, when you, you, at that time, you go to Vanderbilt, that's going to be a tough game. And I say this I've never won at Vanderbilt. Really? I've never won at Vanderbilt. I never won at Ole Miss. I never won at Mississippi State. Now, we take care of them when we, they come to us, but that lets you know how 
tough the huh. SEC was, and we was top ten in the country. You know, so it was it was definitely tough. Doesn't matter who you're going to play. You go to Mississippi State. They got Timmy Bauer, Derek Zimmerman up there. Like those guys can play some basketball. Don't go anywhere. Audible's returns in a moment here on the Spirit Media Network. We believe patient-centered care is where it all begins. That's why King's Daughters Medical Center ranks nationally in patient care and safety. Our staff's commitment to better health care means a higher quality of life for so many. We are one team, one heartbeat, one mission to provide this community with the high quality health care. KDMC, caring for our community like no one else can. Wendy's without the Wendy's app is like a hamburger without the fresh beef. No! Get the app to order ahead, order delivery, earn free food, and get app exclusive offers. One app, all the Wendy's. We're going the extra mile, and we're taking you with us. We have a responsibility to get the work to the streets. Join us on the Extra Mile podcast as we travel Mississippi highways to bring you in-depth conversations with state leaders. Got to have the ability to get their product to market. Infrastructure stakeholders and Mississippi locals to give you a behind-the-scenes look at transportation throughout the state. Highways, um, movement of goods, these are things that we rely on every day. You can listen and watch episodes of the show by visiting gomdot.com forward slash the extra mile. So sweet, so crispy. Nobody makes breakfast as good as Wendy's new homestyle French toast sticks. Nobody. <clears throat> nope. Keep talking. I'm, I, should, I can't I, hear you. I'm, I should probably stop. Choose wisely. Choose Wendy's homestyle French toast sticks. For those on the go, we give you Audibles with Jason Scarborough, the podcast. What are we listening to? Are we listening to a playlist? Are we listening to a podcast? What a great question. Listen to our intimate interviews with guests on your favorite podcast platforms, including iTunes, Google Play, Amazon Music, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, and so many more. Do you ever look back and say, you know, my life, the story could have ended up differently had it not been for your grandparents? In incredibly uh, different, yeah. for sure. Plus, you'll hear behind-the-scenes commentary on each guest, interview preparation, location, and so much more from Jason himself. Do you have a, uh, a favorite Coach Bowden story uh, that you can share with us? I can tell you this. What you see with Bobby Bowden is what you get. Mm. Check out Audibles with Jason Scarborough, the podcast, on any of these popular podcast locations and hit subscribe, download, and enjoy. Now, back to the show. Two thousand three, you lead the team in scoring and assist, sixteen and a half points a game, nearly four assists per game. You're rolling again that year and you roll right into the, the big dance again. But that season doesn't end the way that you want it to either. So, but two trips to the big dance in two years, but you say, you know what, I'm going to the draft. So exactly. what went into that decision process exactly. to, to leave Alabama? Well, my, my sophomore year, you know, we, uh, we started off the season 13-0, and number one in the country. And, you know, at that moment, as a college kid, not knowing what's in front of you, really just kind of locked into college basketball. Then all of a sudden, agents start coming in, mm -hmm. you know, and calling my dad and, you know, and my dad, me and my dad talking. And that was the first <laughs> time we actually had conversations on, hey, you got a chance, they talking this, they talking you, a first round pick, a lottery pick. And I would say that was the moment halfway during the season, my sophomore year, where I actually had thoughts of, I may leave after this year. Now, with that being said, what I, my advice I give to kids in that situation is you got to keep your head down and not, not look ahead. You got you to gotta stay where you are. And I would say that uh, I had those thoughts in my head, you know, being 19 years old, it's hard not to think about the NBA. And I would say uh, when we was number one and we got an SEC play, you can kind of see us kind of slip a little bit. You know, our focus had changed a little bit. And me being older, me being more mature now, it all starts with the head. Mm -hmm. And me not knowing I might, you know, me not feeling or knowing that I'm doing it, but it, it, sometimes how you carry yourself and things you do can implement, has implications on your surroundings, which is my teammates. And 
Um, and then once I kind of dialed it back in midway through the SEC, you know, we kind of finished strong and got into the tournament. And we got, and we, we got upset by Indiana that year. We up 15 and a half and lose that game. And I had some decision to make after the season whether I wanted to come back another year or leave. And I made the decision to leave. And um, I wasn't a first round pick, you know, so it was definitely a, um, you know, a leap of faith, believing in myself, knowing that I'm, I'm, I'm a professional athlete, uh, especially at the highest level in the NBA. And I was just able to put my head down and take everything that I've been through, where I'm from. Where you from means a lot. You know, being from Jackson made me tougher, made me mentally tough, physically tough, able to, you know, um, fight through adversity. Um, all the adverse moments I've been, I've just put my head down and not made an excuse and just went and got it done. And that's, you know, kind of what I did uh, when I was drafted by Utah um, out of Alabama. And at that time, I mean, I traveled, but that was kind of like through AAU going here and going there. But I've never been to Salt Lake City at the time. So it was a culture shock. It was different. I was there by myself. And I remember, and it's a true story, I remember getting drafted by Utah, being a second round pick. And we, I had to, after the draft, the next day I had to fly out there and do a press conference. So I did the press conference and I had to go to my room, you know, because I'm leaving, coming back home the next day. And I literally cried. And it wasn't a, a, a cry of sorrow. It was a cry of kind of, you don't know what's next, right? Hmm. You know, it's just like, it, it wasn't a boo-hoo cry. It was like an emotional cry, you know, just kind of like, you know, letting it out, kind of taking all that, everything that you got going on, just taking it and grabbing it and saying, guess what, I'm going to get it done. I'm going to get it done. Just one of those, that chip just starting to grow, hmm. you know, because I was projected to be a first-round pick. You know, all these teams passed on me. I'm sitting in there um, um, in, at, at Utah. At the time, I came out, you do pre-draft workouts. I worked out for 15 of the 30 teams, 15 of them. Utah wasn't one of the teams I worked out for. So the 15 teams I worked out for, neither one of those teams drafted me. Utah drafted me, and I didn't even work out for them. So me going into the unknown, me going into the unknown, and I just remember my dad calling me, and we talking, and he's just like, hey, and, and, uh, and my partner, uh, I'm sorry, my dad is a uh, stand-up guy, and he always called me partner. Hey, partner, listen. He said, ain't no time to feel sorry for yourself. You got to put your head down and go to work. And that's all he told me. And when I hung that phone up, I just had a chip on my shoulder that was bigger than ever. And I took that chip throughout my career. Don't go anywhere. Audible's returns in a moment here on the Spirit Media Network.
kind of interesting to hear you talk about that moment because it sounds like there was a shift that occurred at that moment for your career going forward. Exactly. Is that safe to say? That, that was the biggest shift in my career because you got to think about it. In high school, I was decorated. Mm -hmm. McDonald's All-American, you know, state player of the year, mm -hmm. you know, 13 par uh, parade All-American nationally. Go to um, Alabama, have a decorated career. SEC freshman of the year, AP News freshman of the year, national freshman of the year. Um, I accomplished being number one in the country at Alabama, the only team to this day to ever be number one in the country at Alabama. You know, all these things. And then it hit the draft and then feel like people saying, well, he's not that good. He's not a real point guard. He's a combo. He's this, you start hearing all these negative things about you and then you not being a first round pick, a second round pick, first round picks are guaranteed. You guarantee four years to even develop. Second round pick, hey, they can wake up tomorrow and say, hey, good luck, but we're gonna move in a different direction. So now I'm in a different mode where I have to really, you know, be a guy that come in and just carve his own way. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I haven't been in that position in my life, you know, so, Really, that can, you can either sink or swim in that, in that point. Feel sorry for yourself. You know, feel like you're not getting a, 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 a fair opportunity. Feel like somebody's against you. Whatever the case may be, I didn't do that. I just put my head down and put a chip on my shoulder, and I worked like I was the worst guy on the team. And that was the best thing that happened for me because um, I went into Utah, played for the great Jerry Sloan, and he gave me an opportunity, and I never looked back. This is what I want to explain. So I, I, I get drafted by Utah, right? Second round picks. So second round picks, they're not guaranteed. I go to summer league. I play, I play the rookie summer league. So when the draft, you know, you play the, the rookies, I'm going to play their summer league. So I play summer league without a contract. So I'm just on <laughs> summer league team. If I get hurt, break my leg, tear my knee up, tear my ankle. They can just send me home. I don't get paid, nothing guaranteed. So I go through that. Then after, after summer league, vet camp comes up in September. Come to vet camp, I'm, I st I'm still on a non-guaranteed contract. I'm going through vet camp. I went through preseason. I go through the first month of the season until they guaranteed my contract for the rest of the year. So all these steps that I went through all these things I'm doing, knocking on wood, not being injured, got to the first uh, week of the season. I mean, November. So November is when my contract was guaranteed. So I went through that year. I'm just on a one-year deal. Any, even when it was guaranteed, one-year deal. So after that one-year deal, when I had an opportunity to play, I did well. So coming into the off, the off season, I'm a free agent all over again. And what happened was Utah loved me. Coach wanted me back, but now all of a sudden they got to give me a contract that they weren't expecting them to do. You know, so it's like, man, we want him back, but we can't get him for the minimum. We're going to have to pay him something, which we're not prepared to do. That's what led me to Milwaukee. And Milwaukee um, signed me to a three-year deal um, and gave me some money. And in retrospect, me putting that chip on my shoulder, going through that first year and getting what I got the second year in Milwaukee, which, which equal to four years, the money that I made in those first four years was equivalent to a first round pick. So it kind of balanced itself out, but I just had to get it the hard way. So August 13th, 08, you're headed to Cleveland. And this is a city that over time just became very special to you for a lot of reasons. But you're teaming up at this point with LeBron James. Mm -hmm. Do you remember your first? interaction with LeBron? Absolutely. I mean, um, we all, we, we knew each other, but didn't know each other beforehand. And what, what people don't understand is <laughs> that in 2007 and 2008 season, my last year in Milwaukee, that season, I played with a um, torn ligament in my thumb and I, had, and I had a torn hernia, sports hernia. And both of them happened early on in the season. And I had went through the whole season playing with it. When the season was over that summer, I had um, hernia surgery and I had thumb surgery two weeks apart, two weeks apart. 
I couldn't work out. I couldn't run. I couldn't jog the whole offseason. The first time I jogged down the court, because um, that summer I got traded to Cleveland. And when I got to um, Cleveland and we got to vet camp, that's the first time I picked up a basketball and ran. Good gracious. And that season I was an NBA All-Star. Don't go anywhere. Audible's returns in a moment here on the Spirit Media Network. Quality of life is about lifelong care. Your family's health care is important to you, and that's important to us. King's Daughters Medical Center is here for your family in every stage of life, from the excited new parents, adolescent and teen years, to the big day. Walking alongside of you in life's journey, living a healthier life. KDMC, caring for our community like no one else can. Wendy's $3 breakfast deal is a bacon or sausage croissant plus seasoned potatoes for just three bucks. It's the kind of breakfast that really sticks with you, especially if you're Tyler. Breakfast. Oh. If you want a better breakfast, you'll never forget. Wendy's is that breakfast. Choose wisely. Choose Wendy's $3 breakfast deal. For those on the go, we give you Audibles with Jason Scarborough, the podcast. What are we listening to? Are we listening to a playlist? Are we listening to a podcast? What a great question. Listen to our intimate interviews with guests on your favorite podcast platforms, including iTunes, Google Play, Amazon Music, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, and so many more. Do you ever look back and say, you know, my life, the story could have ended up differently had it not been for your grandparents? In incredibly uh, different, yeah. for sure. Plus, you'll hear behind-the-scenes commentary on each guest, interview preparation, location, and so much more from Jason himself. Do you have a, uh, a favorite Coach Bowden story uh, that you can share with us? I can tell you this. What you see with Bobby Bowden is what you get. Mm. Check out Audibles with Jason Scarborough, the podcast, on any of these popular podcast locations and hit subscribe, download, and enjoy. Now, back to the show. That's a, that's a lot of surgery yeah. in a compacted amount of time. And so looking at your time in Cleveland, the first time around in Cleveland, so you're there, 08 to 2011, and this is around the time. So LeBron announces he's going to Miami. Well, and well, that, so, so that was at the end. So, but the time there, um, I was young. I was 25, 26, um, and I was playing at a high level, right? LeBron was young, and he was playing at coming into his own. But he was, you know, still really good. Mm -hmm. And we was number one in the league. Every year I was there, and we just never could get over the hump. And I always look back on that, and, and I just wish I was more, I was more mature, like in my preparation and in a lot of different areas. As I got older, as that time passed, I got better. I got more mature. I understood how to watch film. I understood all the little things as far as how to eat, how to take care of your body. Um, I just wish I would have had that, you know, years earlier and I would have been better down the stretch because I look at moments during the, during the season, I was great. But I don't, well, I know for a fact in the playoffs, I wasn't at my best. Um, and I felt like if I was at my best, I would have gave us a better chance, obviously, to win a championship because we, we was good enough to win a championship. Um, just to get to your point, and, you know, when Braun left and obviously went to Miami, um, that's when everything changed for me, you know. So at that point, um, you know, I left and went to the Clippers, and I, had, and I, and I just kind of started a different journey, which 
obviously we'll get to, which led back to Cleveland. Yeah, you kind of kind of bounced around a little exactly. bit there. Uh, you talked about going to from Cleveland to L.A., then Utah again, Portland, Minnesota, and Charlotte. That's a lot of bouncing around for somebody that talking about that chip on the shoulder, which has to be growing at this point. I'm thinking, but during that time in your life, for you personally and, and even your family, that. It had to be tough bouncing around like that. No, it was tough, you know, and I, and, and I think that that was the uh, one of the main reasons that I retired so soon. People said, man, you had a lot of basketball left in me. I said, I, I, I probably did, um, but I, I was done mentally. You know, I wanted to get into coaching. I knew what I wanted to do, and I wanted to be stable. Um, that was important to me. Um, but, you know, bouncing around, you know, going to L.A., um, which – which was great then leaving there going here. I was looking for a home and found myself just kind of not being their guy, not being their guy and just trying to find a home. So that was real difficult. Um, but at the same time, playing at a high level and people don't understand because you're not in a situation that, you know, you're comfortable with doesn't mean you can't be your best. Mm. And I thought that, you know, being mentally tough, being physically tough, it really got me through those moments, trying to find a home, bouncing to each team, because everywhere I went, I played a lot, whether it was starting or whether it was off the bench. I was a major part of that team. Um, you know, going to, going to L.A., playing with Chris Paul, Blake, and all those guys, going to Utah, playing with my good friend, Big Al Jefferson, that's from Mississippi, you know, uh, going to Charlotte, you know, going to Minnesota, going to Portland, playing with Dame, which is one of my close friends today. I'm just talking about in a five-year span, you're talking about bouncing around from team to team and being a part of those teams and playing, not just someone. And then going back to my, you know, my last year in Cleveland, going back and winning the championship and being a big part of that um, was, 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 was tremendous. And to end my career on a championship, I mean, I couldn't ask for a better ending. So I knew I was done after that. So yeah, in 2015, you come back to, to Cleveland to the to the 216, and this was a city that, you know, from from just seeing the post game interviews, even leading up to to that series with Golden State, you know, you you embrace this city, you love Absolutely. Cleveland, and so like you said, for to be able to come back to Cleveland, and you guys fall down three to one mm -hmm. in the series, the NBA Finals to Golden State, and at the time, no NBA team had come back Ever. from a three one deficit. You guys become the first ever team to do it, dramatic fashion, I might say. And so for that moment for you, going back to the bouncing around, going back to that moment you talked about having your rookie season where that chip started to grow. But now Mo Williams, NBA champion. No one can take that away from you. I heard Nobody. you at the victory parade. Look, I'm a champ. Nobody can take that away from me. How satisfying was that to, to hoist that trophy? I tell people all the time, when you do something and pour something in so much and you get the gratification uh, at the highest level of reward that you can get from what you do, there's no better feeling. There's no better feeling at all. It's a feeling you can't explain. It's, a, um, it's something that just goes through your body that you can't control, you know? And to win that championship, to go from there, to get on that plane, to land back in Cleveland and see all those thousands, thousands of people at the airport and to wake up the next day for the parade and have 1.5 million people downtown um, Cleveland at our parade, a parade, parade that was supposed to last, you know, two hours to go around, which took seven hours because it was so many people and we couldn't move. Um, that feeling, that experience will stay with me for the rest of my life. It's going to stay with the people of Cleveland too. That ended a 52-year championship crazy thing drought. About it, you know, I, I was number two when I was in Cleveland my first time around. Yeah. And Kyrie was two when I came back. And I changed my number to 52 because uh, my, my, my uh, childhood number was 25, um, right? And I couldn't wear 25 in Cleveland the first time around because Mark Price is retired, so I took two. I either take two or five or, or, or 25. And I came back, and I just, the, the season before, I scored 52 points in Minnesota. So I went to Cleveland the next year. So guess what number I picked? 52. 
Guess how many years Cleveland sports has not won a championship? 52. So that synergy between that number was just tremendous. Please tell me you still have that jersey. I do. It's I locked do. away safely, hopefully. Absolutely. Right. I hope so. I hope so. Don't go anywhere. Audible's returns in a moment here on the Spirit Media Network. That season was was bittersweet because, like you said, it ended up – game seven ended up being your, your final game yes. in the NBA. You played that – the duration of that year, you had a torn ligament yep. and a thumb. Then you were diagnosed with CMP. And I don't know if people understand how painful that is. Um, so it was almost like you knew it was, it was time to hang it up. But yeah. still, to get to that moment, I always like to ask former athletes this, to know that you're, you're hanging something up that – you basically done the, the entire of your life. Exactly. How difficult was that moment? It was difficult because, you know, after I won the championship a month later, I had surgery, you know, because um, that whole season. So to start the season, Kyrie was hurt. So I started the first half of the season until Christmas. You know, I started the first, you know, 25, 30 games of the season. I'm averaging 14 and seven, you know, and people don't know the story. Um, so I, I started, played a lot. And then when Kyrie came back, I didn't play. You know, I was just a role. I, I didn't get in the game until the finals, until the finals, you know, and, and I was battling my injuries. I was rehabbing. I was doing things. So the gratification of being able to have a part, because you can be a part of a team, but have mm -hmm. a part in the championship is two different things. To be able to have that moment, to have a part, of success, being that you're there. I mean, it made that decision, you know. Now, it's going to be a tough decision regardless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the fact that, you know, you can sit back on your career and have, you know, close to 11,000 points, 4, 000, almost 4,000 assists. I might be over 11,000 points, close to 4,000 assists. 
I mean, you look back and say, hey, it ain't too many players that done done that. Yeah, you talk about the Hall of Fame guy, but I'm talking about a kid from Mississippi, second round pick, you know, to go in and, and play 13 years and have these type of numbers and this type of success and becoming an all-star. And doing these type of things, I thought, you know, for me, um, I thought I've done enough. You know, I thought, of, you know, Dylan going through their career and having five surgeries, um, bouncing back from them and understanding what's important is your family. And I thought that uh, at that time it was, it was time to dedicate my life to something else. Well, I'm thinking at this point, you know, it's going to be toes in the sand, relaxing, right? Absolutely not. But not for you. In May 2018, you're like, nope. You become assistant coach. Mm -hmm. You're reunited with Mark Gofford out at Cal State Northridge as an assistant coach. So now you're, you're starting a different journey with basketball. So how would you describe your experience out there with, with Coach Godfrey? Well, it's something I love to do. I love to teach. I love to coach. And when I play um, in the NBA every summer, I, I say this all the time, every summer, you know, after the season, are you guys going on vacation and doing this and that? After the last game of the season, I, I was off season. I was living in Dallas at the time. I had a gym. I built a gym. So after that, I come home and I coach my youth. I coach my AAU teams. I literally coach. I literally in practice with them. So I knew what I wanted to do when I retired. So when I retired, I just took a year to just kind of get my get my uh, mental back and just kind of just relax. But that following year, I jumped right into coaching. And I went to someone that I trust, played college ball with, really good friends. And he brought me along with his staff. And, and not only did he bring me with his staff, he prepared me to be a head coach. And it only took me two years. You know, and I just kind of followed his blueprint. He taught me a lot of the things outside of basketball that I need to be prepared for. And in two years, I was ready to, to, to um, you know, do my thing myself. And I got the job at Alabama State, um, you know, and that was a real learning experience there for the last two years. Now I'm at Jackson State where I feel like I got everything down. You know, I'm able to make adjustments when need be outside of basketball, put uh, myself and my team and my players and my coaches, put them in a great situation to be successful. So talking about Alabama State, now being at Jackson State, I've, I've heard you say in a couple of spots the pride you take in representing SWAC schools. You know, growing up, going to games with your dad, um, and now you're at Jackson State. So... Where do you think that pride originated from? Going to those games with your dad growing up or, or being a Jackson product? Where, where does that pride originate from, you think? Well, you know, the, the Jackson State love happened when I was born, right? Uh, my mom graduated from Jackson State. My okay. dad attended there. He attended Valley and Jackson State where he met my mom before he went to the service. My, my younger brother attended Jackson State. I, had a, I have an older brother that, that um, I always brag about that attended West Point, graduate from West Point, which is pre prestigious um, within itself. And my sister graduated from Valley. She's the only outsider, so per se. <laughs> but um, Jackson State has always been a part of everything we've done. I mean, when you're talking about a football game, we don't miss them. You talk about a basketball, we don't miss them. I went to baseball game because those are my three main sports, so I didn't miss those coming up. You know, uh, Coach Brady, that was a Hall of Fame baseball coach, Jack State. I remember him when I was a kid, you know, because I was a baseball guy. And um, so Jackson State has always been a part of me. I never visioned coaching at Jackson State. But when that opportunity came about, it's something that I couldn't turn down just because – what it meant to me and to be able to be a part of it and really put my imprint on it, it, it was something second to none, something that I couldn't pass up. And to have that pride that I want to be great personally, mm -hmm. that's, that's one thing, but to be somewhere where you love and you don't want to see that place fail, it's almost like you, if I'm not successful at Jackson State, I've let my family down. Hmm. Don't go anywhere. Audible's returns in a moment here on the Spirit Media Network. When you find a great community, you will find great health care. That is exactly what King's Daughters Medical Center provides. Keeping businesses moving with occupational wellness, heart healthy screenings, diabetes education and management, community education, and remote patient monitoring that promotes better care in between regular office visits. 
KDMC, caring for our community like no one else can. Wendy's $3 breakfast deal is a bacon or sausage croissant plus seasoned potatoes for just three bucks. It's the kind of breakfast that really sticks with you, especially if you're Tyler. Ah. My breakfast. Oh. <laughs> if you want a better breakfast, you'll never forget. Wendy's is that breakfast. Choose wisely. Choose Wendy's $3 breakfast deal. So let's do a little rewind in your career. What do you say? Uh, these are questions I've always wanted to ask you. Toughest to guard while you played at Alabama? At Alabama, Z Derek Zimmerman. Really? At uh, Mississippi State. He was, a t he was so athletic. You know, uh, I'm, I'm fast. I'm quick. You know, I'm laterally quick. You know, vertically, not so much. Not, you know, to the point where I can't jump at all, but we're talking about Derek Zimmerman. I mean, he touching the top of the backboard. <laughs> and he played the same position I play. Um, so it was just tough to guard him. So I would say, uh, Derek, you know, DZ, I'm giving you a shout out right now. But he was, he was definitely the toughest guard in, right, in I'm gonna the go, SEC. I'm going to go polar, I'm gonna go polar opposite now. Player, whether college, high school, NBA, who got under your skin? Just agitated the Chris fire out Paul. of Chris Paul. Really? Chris Paul because he's such a great player and he know how to antagonize you. <laughs> and he do it so slick. And me and him are good friends, so he didn't do it to me as much, um, you know, because, you know, but he do it to everybody else. He do it, he just get under people's skin and he do it on purpose because he's such a great guy, but on the court, he's just a menace. And um, he's, he's, uh, he's great because he just, he hold the ball, not hold the ball, but the ball in his hands a lot. So just imagine you have to guard somebody with the ball in their hands mm -hmm. all the time. Me, if I'm not coming off and shooting, I got to pass the ball, cut through, and the ball got to move, but not with him. So those guys are really the toughest guys to guard because every time down the court, you're going to be in a pick and roll. You're going to be in something, some kind of action where you have to guard that guy. And typically, when you're a Chris Paul status, <laughs> you're going to get the benefit of the whistle. You think so? So it makes it a little bit tougher <laughs> to guard those guys. If you don't go to Alabama to play your college basketball, where, where do you think you end up? Ole Miss. Really? Because the relationships with Justin and Yep. Reed it was either Ole Miss or Mississippi State. Okay, okay. All right, so I'm going to switch it up on you a little bit. So what, what is Mo Williams like at home when you're relaxing? I heard you talking to Bill Blackwell here at the Sports Hall of Fame and Museum. Uh, about playing golf. You don't. You never want me to play golf with you, by the way. <laughs> just don't ask me. I, I should be arrested. I'm so bad at playing golf. But what do you do just to chill out and, and wind down? Well, one thing I do recreation, I definitely uh, golf. I'm an avid golfer. I love to golf. Um, it's just something that clears my mind. I'm just, you know, I love, the, I love being on the golf course, um, just the scenery, the greenery, all that. Uh, but outside of golf, I mean, it's just me at home with my family, just, you know, flip-flops on, pajamas on, with my kids, uh, with my wife, uh, spending time with my brothers and my sisters and my mom. You know, we always have our, you know, get-togethers, game nights per se. Um, that, that's me in a nutshell. You know, I'm sitting on the couch and I got ESPN Plus on because I'm watching all games. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a sports fanatic. 
Um, I'm a basketball guy, but I watch all sports, but definitely watch, during basketball season, I'm watching college basketball because I'm a college coach beforehand. You know, I'm going to watch the NBA, but now I watch a lot of college basketball. Final question for you. What do you think of young Mo Williams growing up in Hines County? We talked about that earlier. What do you think young Mo Williams would think about all that you've accomplished? NBA champion, head coach at Jackson State now, decorated career at Alabama, Murrah High School, and you're still writing your story. What do you think that young kid growing up in Hines County would think about all that you've accomplished and you're still accomplishing? Keep pushing. Yeah. You ain't accomplished everything yet. Still wearing that chip on your shoulder, huh? Gonna stay there. Yeah. I haven't. I, my goal is to be the best coach in college basketball. My goal is to win a national championship, and I won't stop until I achieve that goal. This is an interview I've wanted to do for a while, and I, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention your dad. Uh, when I did sports radio, I was telling you for the interview, he would call into our shows, big sports guy, and. Uh, Sorry to hear that, that he's no longer with us, but I always love talking sports with your dad on sports radio. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know you're making him proud. Absolutely. That's so, my angel. Yeah. That's my angel. Uh, first uh, first SWAC conference game, um, you know, we're down eight, four minutes to go. We're down two with 11 seconds to go, and we hit a three to win the game. Wow. Who do you think wheeled that ball in? Oh, I, know, I have no doubt you know, who it was. So for me, that's my angel. Man, thank you for doing this. And I look, sure I, I'm going to continue it. to watch your story. I'm rooting for you at Jackson State. And like I said, an interview I've wanted to do for a long time. So thanks for joining us for Audibles, and I hope we get to do part two down the road. Absolutely, anytime. Matthew's like, all right, y'all. Mo Williams. Look at that. Brought up the big guns today. You ready? All right, three, two, and one. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week for another episode of Audibles with Jason Scarborough.